Hi everyone, welcome to lesson two of Transforming Trauma. And uh, I'm Jim Gordon and we're going to be doing uh, an experiment, another experiment in this lesson. With uh, This time we'll be working with our imagination. But first, uh, what I want to do is to tell you a little bit about the transformational power that lives within trauma. And before we get into that talk, let's sit for a moment and breathe together. And uh, I, I like to do this at the beginning of each class because it gives us an opportunity to relax, to be present in this moment, to let go of whatever we've been doing before, to um, put on hold whatever we may be doing afterwards, and to relax and come into the present moment where we're able to empty our cups and just be, just be here with whatever is unfolding. So, sit comfortably in your chair, just relaxing, perhaps closing your eyes to remove external stimulation, and breathing deeply in through your nose and out through your mouth with your belly soft and relaxed. Remember, this is a concentrative meditation, so we're focusing on the breath coming in through our nose and out through our mouth, on our bellies softening and relaxing, and on the word soft as we breathe in, and belly as we breathe out. Letting your whole body relax with each exhalation. Relaxing a little more with each breath. If thoughts come, let them come and let them go, gently bring your mind back to soft belly. Thoughts come, let them come, notice them, let them go, gently bring your mind back to soft. Just a few more slow, deep breaths.
Okay, slowly, gently open your eyes, let your attention come back in the room. I hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed this little soft belly excursion or adventure or descent into our bodies and our relaxed being here. Uh, I find it so helpful when I'm talking with you, when I'm listening to somebody else, before I eat a meal, before I go into a meeting. I hope you're having the opportunity to experiment with soft belly at various times in, in your own life. Uh, one thing I want to mention is, uh, as I give the instructions, I say, if thoughts come, let them come, let them go. Gently bring your mind back to soft belly breathing. The fact is the thoughts are going to keep on coming. Uh, people sometimes think that meditation is about abolishing all thought. Well, every once in a while, that may come as a grace. And then what happens, you start patting yourself on the back. Oh, there are no more thoughts. And of course, you're back into thinking again. The way that is most helpful to approach meditation is to understand that thoughts are going to come. Let them come. Let them go. They will start losing their power over you. The power, particularly the thoughts of previous trauma, of previous injury, of previous hurt, aggravation, pain. Those thoughts which are so disruptive and destructive to us, they may never totally disappear, but the more we accustom ourselves to be in this state of relaxed moment-to-moment -moment awareness of meditation, of soft belly breathing, the less power those thoughts have over us. And that's crucially important as we move ourselves through and beyond trauma. One of the ways that I, th I think is particularly helpful to think about trauma is that it fixes us. It keeps us tied to the past so that we're reacting physiologically. We're tense and irritable and hyper alert, just as we were when the threat arose. And uh, we're acting as if the threat is in the room or next door to us when maybe it's gone away, long gone. And so we're reacting with that state of hypervigilance and readiness for a fight or readiness to get out of there. The more we bring ourselves into the present, the less troubled, the less tortured we are by those physiological states of hyperarousal, and the more distance we also have on the traumatic events. One of the things that happens to us with trauma is we tend to fixate on what happened. We have nightmares about bad things that happened, or we have flashbacks while we're awake. So we're stuck, we're imprisoned by the past that's no longer happening. Or let's say the stress or trauma is ongoing, uh, we keep returning to it even though we may be in the room having a nice conversation with someone or attending to a, a task that has nothing to do with the trauma. Soft belly breathing helps to free us from the shackles of that past trauma, from the physiological response, the, the sort of aroused, irritable, anxious, fearful, angry, physiological response, and from the memories of what happened, and from the thoughts that are preoccupying and torturing us. We get a little distance from them. So instead of being overwhelming thoughts, they become just thoughts. So meditation is crucial at every step of our passage through and beyond trauma. Now, one of the things one of the understandings that we have largely lost about trauma is one that indigenous people all over the world have had from recorded history on and, and likely much, much earlier. And that is the understanding that trauma can open the door to transformation. That in fact, as many indigenous people have stated, and as the leaders of indigenous people, the healers and the chiefs have stated, the trauma is in fact the way that profound change is brought about. Now, indigenous people understand this uh, enough 
so that they make traumatic rituals a part of the growing up process of every little girl and boy. These rites of passage from childhood to adolescence and adolescence to adulthood take that young person out of her or his conventional environment and create an atmosphere that's often overwhelming and terrifying. And often these young people are terrified for their lives because all around them there are elders in masks and war paint and they're screaming and shouting and drumming and the kids are isolated from their normal social environment. And what these rites of passage do is to break up the previous pattern. It's a kind of a dramatic emptying out of the cup. Break up the previous pattern of thoughts and behavior and the roles of childhood or adolescence so that they're in, in, in tatters. And then the rite of passage creates or helps the child or adolescent discover a new identity as a teenager or an adolescent in the society, or indeed as an adult with the responsibilities and the roles and the respect that's due adults. And this is a regular part of tribal life in just about every indigenous society that I've ever spent any time studying. There are two other aspects to understanding this kind of disruptive but creative role of trauma is that those children or young people who have a traumatic event befall them, let's say there's a life-threatening illness or a child becomes depressed, suicidally depressed and is in despair, those children who are tended to by the official healers in that society are helped to understand that this th terrible thing that has befallen them can be the beginning of a transformation that gives them a deeper understanding than they've ever had or could even imagine. And in many societies, the official healer of the society picks out the next official healer from those boys or girls who have successfully gone through this life-threatening experience, successfully made their way past a serious depressive episode or even a psychotic episode, that with the official healer, they have learned what they need to learn to move through this episode, and they have come to a place of greater understanding and compassion. And often enough, the official healer will say to that little girl or little boy, okay, you, I want you to study with me. You've shown an aptitude for it. That these uh, powers that uh, you never knew you had have begun to emerge as you've been able to come through this crisis. Similarly, it is understood in traditional societies that for adults who have experienced a major trauma, that not only can the trauma be transformative, but it has to be honored and it has to be, um, the person has to be guided and guarded. So for example, in many societies, and there are many, uh, there are many American Indian tribes uh, that have this practice, when a warrior, or had this practice when they were fighting battles against other tribes or against the white man, when they would come back from a battle, there would be a period of separation and ritual cleansing and caring that was often led by elder women in the society, that they were bringing this compassionate care and allowing the warriors to uh, feel the full weight of what had happened to them in battle and also to shed that identity, the identity of the warrior, of the killer, and move back into a peacetime identity. It's important to note that we do not, in general, afford that to our modern warriors, our modern military or police who've been in a battle or others who have been in a traumatic and terrifying situation. And we need to bring that back into our collective life, 
just the way we're bringing that understanding back into all of our individual lives here in this course on transforming trauma. So this transformation is possible. I want to emphasize this. We have known this as a species for thousands of years, and we're beginning to rediscover it. Modern psychologists, as I may have mentioned to you before, call this post-traumatic growth. This understanding that the trauma, whether it's the trauma of a loss of a loved one, a loss of a spouse or a partner, or being in prison or dealing with a life-threatening illness, that what has been observed now repeatedly over the last 35 years or so, or 40 years, is that this kind of traumatic experience can open us to a new life with greater understanding, greater intelligence, greater compassion for other people, and a larger vision of what it means to be human. That this is a, an aspect, a, a natural aspect, an evolutionary process. And what we need to do is to understand that this process is possible, to open ourselves to it, to find a way to go through it safely, and, and this is the subject of what we're teaching and learning here in Transforming Trauma, is to facilitate this process with a whole range of self-care techniques. Now, the first piece of research that was done on post-traumatic growth was done on aviators whose planes had been downed during the Vietnam War, who were then imprisoned, and what they jokingly, with that uh, wonderful humor that people are able to preserve even in the worst circumstances, they were imprisoned in what they called the Hanoi Hilton. Terrible conditions, physical torture, psychological torture, separation from families, threats, brutality, terrible food, continuing, ongoing. Many of the aviators were in there for two, three, five, seven years. A study was done by an Air Force psychiatrist. He interviewed them some years later. And what he learned is that every one of them, everyone, including best known one, who was the late Senator John McCain, every one of them said, you know, it was the worst experience of my life. It was unbelievably horrible. And I am a far better person for having been through this experience. And everyone, it's not just me who's saying it, everyone is saying it. My partner, my wife, my spouse, my kids, my, my in-laws. <laughs> They're saying, you know, you're a nicer guy. You don't get angry so easily. You're more thoughtful. And kids say, you're caring more about us. You're more interested in what we're doing. Before you were just so wrapped up in what you were doing. So that's what came out of this first study on post-traumatic growth with these aviators. And that has been the, um, the result of many, many more studies done on people who've experienced cancer as children and adults, people who've uh, dealt with the losses of family members, the death of spouses, which have been terribly traumatic, but they've come out of that kinder, more thoughtful, with new vision for who they can be in the world. I want to tell you one story that I think is a really illustrative of this uh, transformation, of this post-traumatic growth. And then we're going to do uh, an experiment that will help us move a little further down the road uh, of post-traumatic growth, an experiment that I hope will help us to mobilize our imagination to see what might be possible. Now, the story is about a little girl in Gaza named Azar Jendia. And she's somebody whom I write about uh, in my book, Transforming Trauma. She was also the, featured in a CBS 60 Minutes segment uh, about our work with war traumatized kids in Gaza and Israel. And Azar was in a group of eight children in Gaza, who, um, all of whom, had lost their fathers in the 2014 war between Hamas and Israel. 
And the group was led by a, a grade school teacher. And she was using exactly the same program that I'm sharing with you here in Transforming Trauma with the Kids. And in that first group, after the kids had learned soft belly breathing, she had them do three drawings. And when I met Azar, some weeks after she'd been in that first group, she showed me her drawings. And these first three drawings are one that, ones that we're going to be doing in, uh, in, in a few minutes. And what Azar had done is she condensed the first two drawings. The first drawing is draw yourself, and the second drawing is draw yourself with your biggest problem. And the drawing she did combined herself and herself with her biggest problem. And what you could see in the drawing, what was initially most striking is planes flying overhead, dropping bombs on her house, which was crumbling. And next to the house was lying a body drenched in red. And Azar said, that's my father. He was killed. And next to him were two other bodies. Those are my uncles, she said. And then a little ways away, another body. That's my aunt. All four of them were killed in the 2014 war. And then at the top of the page, all four of the bodies were lying there as if they'd already gone up to heaven. And then at the bottom, at the bottom of the page, in a corner, was a little tiny stick figure with its mouth turned down in sadness. And Azar said, that's me. Tragic drawing. The third drawing was the solution to her biggest problem. And normally, and I think many of you will see this when you come to do drawings, that solution gives ideas about positive things that can happen in the future. But when Azar began this group, learning these techniques five months after the war was over, the solution to her problem of the death of her father, two uncles, and an aunt, and her sorrow, was a picture that showed her in the grave with her father. She said, the only solution to my problem is for the Israelis to kill me, for me to be in a grave with my father whom I loved. Azar did nine groups, like nine classes, using the same techniques that we have been and will be continuing to use. And at the end of those nine groups, she did another set of drawings. She drew herself. This time she was a big girl with a big skirt and she was in the center of the page and she had these brown curls flowing down, same curls she has in real life. And there was a smile on her face. There was an arrow coming from her heart through a heart that she'd drawn. And in the heart was written, I love nature. And Azar said, I'm writing in the English. I'm learning in school. Um, I love nature now. I love to be alive. And the arrow was headed for a tree with beautiful green and brightly colored blossoms. That's who Azar, who had been a stick figure in the first drawing, had become. The second drawing was who she would like to be. It's a variation on the third drawing in the first set. Uh, this time, she drew herself in a white coat with a stethoscope around her neck. And the resonator, which picks up sounds, was on the chest of someone lying on a table. And I said, what's this? Who are you? And Azar said, I am a heart doctor. Ever since the war, so many people in Gaza have had their hearts hurt, and I am taking care of them. 
And I said, and who are these five figures standing next to the, next to the table? And she looked at me with this big grin on her face and she said, oh, those are my other patients. They're waiting for me. And then in the third drawing of how she's going to get to be that heart doctor, she drew herself at a desk with lots of books. She said, I'm going to study hard and I'm going to go to medical school so I can become a doctor. The drawings have the power to bring out what's inside us, just as they brought out a czar's despair in the first set of drawings, they also have the capacity to bring out our hope, what's possible for us, just as they did in the second set. So in the next segment, in our next time together, we're going to do the drawings, the first set of drawings, ourselves. And each of you is going to have an opportunity to do the drawings and to make the discoveries that the drawings will reveal to you. When we reassemble to do the drawings, please bring three sheets of paper, eight and a half by 11, be great, and crayons or magic markers uh, so that you can do the drawings yourself. And then I will give you the instructions and we'll do the three drawings and you'll have an opportunity to see what these three drawings, what this first set of drawings that Azar did, what they have to show you. This experiment is a way of making discoveries for yourself and making discoveries in a way that bypasses the, um, uh, the kind of critical left brain, and I'm oversimplifying here, it bypasses our critical censoring mind that often gets mobilized when we use words. Do I want to say this? Do I not want to say that? So when we do these drawings, just let it come. Let it come out on the page. I'm going to give you an instruction for each of these drawings. And when I do, just respond and let your hand move on the page and whatever wants to come out is fine. There is no Ms. Grundy. I don't know if any of you had Ms. Grundy as an art teacher. I definitely had her as an art teacher in third grade. And I can still remember the scowl on her face as she looked at my drawings, which I'm laughing now, but it wasn't a laughing matter to me then because it, it really inhibited me. So some of us have those inhibitions. Just let it come. No Ms. Grundy here. No uh, judgmental older brother or sister. This is just for you, just for each of us. What I'd like you to do is on these three pages. Oh, we have a, we have a visitor, a feline visitor. Maybe she'll do some drawings too. Who knows? Uh, on each page, put your name and the date and number them, one for page one, two for page two, and three for page three, because you're gonna to wanna to keep these drawings. We'll be returning to them later on, and you may wanna to return to them long after our time together is over. And, and the way to approach these drawings is with the, with the Zen Buddhist motto, first thought, best thought. Just let it come. Okay, and I'm going to, we're going to do these very quickly, just a few minutes for each drawing. Any questions about that so far, about the instructions? Okay, so I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes for, put your papers down for a moment. Just close your eyes and take a few deep breaths. It's great to come to these drawings with the mind open and the body relaxed. So breathing slowly and deeply in through the nose, out through the mouth with your belly soft and relaxed. Okay. Open your eyes and on page one, 
withdraw yourself, whatever that means to you. For some of you, it may be a representational drawing. Others may do something abstract. Someone else may do stick figures only. Whatever comes to you and whatever this means to you, draw yourself. And I'm going to do this along with you. Just another minute for this first one. Okay, put away this first drawing, understanding that there may well be more that you would have added if there'd been more time. It's okay, whatever's there is perfect just the way it is. Now take another couple of deep breaths, close your eyes for a moment and just breathe deeply. Just relaxing. Good, now open your eyes and draw yourself with your biggest problem. And again, whatever that means to you, whatever it looks like, whatever comes to you, just let it come out on the page.
Okay, another minute for this. And again, just let it flow, let it come out, whatever it looks like. Okay, put aside the second drawing. And sit for a moment, eyes closed, allowing your breathing to deepen. Just breathing deeply, relaxing, letting go of drawing number two. And now open your eyes and draw yourself with your problem solved. And again, this is not lining up, maybe this, maybe that, maybe the other thing. This is just allowing it to emerge from your imagination, your intuition, your unconscious mind. Just open up. What would you look like with your biggest problem solved? Just draw that. Another minute on this one. Okay, coming, coming to a close with this one. Now, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, each of us is gonna hold up in front of the camera, uh, each drawing in turn. So I'm gonna ask you, because we wanna give people a sense of, you know, what are the possibilities? There are however many of us are here, 25 of us, just give, give people a sense of what the range is because each of us is different. It's really important to understand we're all, biologically different, we're all psychologically different, 
all have different hopes, aspirations, connections, histories. We're all unique. It's very important on a deep biological level. This is, this is work that's been done over the last 50 years about biochemical individuality. Each of us is different. And so our drawings are gonna be different. I said at the beginning, there's no wrong way to do these drawings. There's nothing wrong with any drawing. All the drawings are reflective of what's going on in this moment and how it emerges from us on the page. So everyone, hold up drawing number one. Here's me. And hold it up so your camera can pick it up. I'm just going to hold mine for a minute, and I'm going to put mine down so I can see all of yours. Let's see them. Okay. All those different drawings. of Those are drawings of yourself right now, right in this moment. Beautiful, thank you. Put them down. Now, let's hold up drawing number two. Yourself with your biggest problem. Let me see what you got. Fantastic. And if you have a chance, check out it. Everybody's drawing too, as you look, it's always interesting. All those who are in the course are gonna have plenty of time to look at the drawings and talk about them. Here, we're just giving them a feeling for what this is, what this is like, and each of you is gonna have a feeling. The, the incredible differences. Okay, let's put down drawing two, and let's hold up drawing three. You with your problem solved. Beautiful. This is great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. You know, one thing everybody is going to have a, a different trajectory, a different kind of passage from drawing to drawing to drawing. And uh, as you take time later on to look at your drawings, just, just look for yourself, see what evolved, see what changed over time. And uh, you may wanna make some notes on it, may wanna write down in a journal you keep, or at least on a piece of paper, what you saw in each of the drawings. And one of the things I want to remark on uh, is that the drawings often, in the solution to the problem, it's often quite surprising. How many of you were surprised by the solution? Just want to see hands. Yeah. So for many, it's surprise. Sometimes it's very commonsensical, and you know, I, you know, I, I, my biggest problem is I don't have a house, and in the third drawing, there's a house. But it also may be the biggest problem I don't have a house. But the solution is I need to hang out with my family more in the tiny apartment we do have right now. And so the picture comes up of people with their family hanging out because that's the solution right now. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So the solution is one that's coming to you and coming out of your own understanding, your own, your own wisdom. The, the other thing I want to mention is that if you do these drawings a number of times, and I've done them many hundreds of times, they will likely change and sometimes change very dramatically. Sometimes if there's a particular problem that preoccupies us, it may be somewhat similar, but we're also changing. We're changing all the time. And so the drawings will change as we change. Now, each of you has the three drawings and you'll have an opportunity to take a look at each of those drawings. And the idea here is for you to discover what's there. What does the drawing of yourself have to say to you? Who are you there on the page? What does it bring up in you? What feelings, what thoughts does seeing yourself drawn on the page bring up for you? Give yourself a little chance. You may want to write this down as well. 
then look at drawing two. Yourself with your biggest problem. What do you see here? What's the biggest problem? Are you surprised? Is this what you expected to be there? What does it look like? What does it feel like to confront yourself, to look at yourself with your biggest problem? And write that down as well. And then look at drawing three. What's the solution to your problem? Does it make sense? Are you surprised? Uh, disappointed? Astonished? Look at it. See what it brings up in you. See what it has to teach you. See if there's a message that can help you move forward, that can help you transform the biggest problem, the trauma you may have experienced. Give yourself a little bit of time to take in what you've drawn, what's come from inside you, from your own imagination, your own intuition. And write that down as well. And now make sure you keep those drawings. We'll be returning to them later on in these classes that we're having. So put them in a safe place. Of course, take a look at them whenever you'd like. And if, if you feel like doing similar drawings at other times, feel free. This is a beautiful way to become aware of what's actually happening and to access your imagination and your intuition to discover potential solutions to the problems, to discover the hope, the light in the middle of the darkness that trauma so often brings. In the next video, you'll have an opportunity to uh, uh, see what happens when we do these drawings with a group of people. And I'll ask one of the people in the group to share her drawings with you. So you'll have a sense of, of, of what, what can come up. And this hopefully will give you, a, you know, a, a not some more ideas about how to look at and think about the kinds of drawings that you're making, that each of you is creating. Tati, uh, thank you so much for being willing to share your drawings. Maybe you could tell people just a, a, a little bit about who you are before we take a look at those drawings. Sure. Um, so my name is Tatiana Znayenka Miller and um, Jim, I was your assistant for uh, nearly two years. And um, before that, I was a research intern at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. And now I am the manager of uh, media outreach and professional collaboration, uh, really working with my passion, which is bringing this work to larger organizations, specifically healthcare organizations and medical schools. Um, I think that the work that you're doing, Jim, and that we're doing at the center should be a part of everyone's education, um, no matter who they are, where they come from. So um, personally, I am a doctor of public health student right now, uh, getting my PhD in preventive care. So essentially, how can we stop problems from developing um, before they become the issues that they've become? And um, and yeah, I'm loving the work that I'm doing and loving working with you. Great, thanks so much. And thanks for being willing to share because this is, this is very personal, what you're gonna be sharing. So I really uh, very much appreciate it as a, you know, giving people an, ex an example and a sense of what it's like to do the drawings and to learn from them. So let's just, let's begin. This is the, let's look at your first drawing. The first drawing is who are you? Draw yourself. So tell us, show us the first drawing and tell us who you are. So this is my first drawing. Um, and I drew myself here as an ocean. And um, as you can see, there are waves of differing forms. There's a lot of variance in size and shape. And what these waves are actually meant to represent uh, for me is the emotions that I'm experiencing. Um, and this is kind of new for me. Um, I haven't always been so in touch with um, my mind and with my body and um, with the depth and magnitude of what I'm experiencing and the scope too. Um, and so I just drew myself as this ocean in an attempt to represent that I can never really seem to feel what's coming anymore. And some days the tides will be um, predictable and other days it's like a storm rolls in. So. Um, this is who I am in this moment. Thank you. 
And number two, you with your biggest problem. This is me with my biggest problem. Um, so it's me underneath this kind of boulder and underneath there are these squiggly lines of different colors. Um, and I drew this one right after I had been diagnosed uh, with COVID-19. Um, and I was feeling a lot of uh, physical symptomatology, but also psychological. Um, having a hard time getting up in the morning. Um, luckily, I had a, an overall light case, but um, what came up for me was more um, substantial and deeper than I had expected. And um, what it was was feelings um, of a, a previous sexual assault that um, that I just I felt everywhere in my body, and it was this feeling of immovability um, and of not knowing or owning my body having it be kind of this foreign thing to me again. Um, and it was, it's, it's hard, I think, um, to grapple with that kind of feeling and to be at peace with it. And so um, when I drew this, I, it's completely representative of the way that I felt, which is just stuck um, underneath this thing. And um, at the bottom here, I drew these squiggly lines and I wasn't quite sure what that meant. But reflecting back, um, I think it's supposed to be DNA. And so this drawing represents um, how I'm feeling in this moment, but also my fears pertinent to whether or not this experience was going to be something that affected me for the rest of my life. You know, um, when things happen, I think that we we hope to move through them and beyond them and have it just kind of be a part of our past. But this experience is so much a part of who I am and it's informed what I believe. And so in that sense, it is part of my, it's my genetic kind of um, responsibility and, and endowment, so. So let's look at that drawing again. So people, uh, just to make sure that everybody understands, wh who, where are you? And I'm this person kind of, I am just lying down, my legs are kind of up. Um, I have no face, just eyes and um, no real expression, just kind of there. And, and number three, this is draw yourself with your problem solved. Uh, what does this look like? This is me with my problem solved. So um, this is this mass again. It's a little bit less threatening. Um, and I'm actually on top of it this time. And we're rolling forward together kind of as this unit um, in synchronicity with one another. And um, here, I think that I'm acknowledging um, and being a little bit more at peace with what's happened um, now and in the past, and also recognizing that um, it's not all bad. You know, there's a lot of good that came from um, the experience that I had years ago and the experience that I had now with COVID, and um, and recognizing that um, it's it's a strength um, as well as a weakness. But um, I have to look at it as a strength. So let's look at number two and number three together, and. Any anything else come to your mind as you look at the two of them together, as you look at the the the, the design, the colors, the shapes. What what do you see as you look at them? Yeah, so I think what's most striking um, as I'm looking at these now is this one. I'm not moving at all, and this one there's explicit movement. So I'm kind of rolling on top of this thing with these arrows that are meant to represent that movement. And um, in these arrows, also they're kind of different. Um, textures, some are wavy and some are straight. And I think that here I'm kind of getting at um, recognizing that it's not all going to be linear and um, it's not all going to be what I expect. You know, it's not all going to be a straight line. There is some um, kind of variance to it. What about the color and the, and the, uh, and the, the form, the actual picture? Yeah, so uh, this one, it's all dark colors. Um, and in this one, I'm using a lot of light colors. I'm using yellow, um, my favorite color, but I also drew myself with um, expressions and with my blonde hair, so. So you drew yourself with the whole body. In the yeah, way. yeah, and, and some shoes, it looks like. <laughs> so th this is really important to, to see the difference. This is just a, a couple minutes apart and allowing your imagination to come up with a solution. What was the feeling that came up with that third drawing? Um, hope, I think, Jim. Hope is what came up for me. Um, and also strength. Um, in the second drawing, when I look at it, I feel weakness. I feel um, overwhelmed. 
And then the third one, I feel strong and I feel um, empowered and um, and like I'm doing something. So great, and and that's that's the the potential in this in this experiment and doing these drawings is to discover both to take a look at the the problem and the pain that's there on the one hand to recognize it which we have to do if we're going to really move through and beyond trauma and not just kind of try to sweep it under the rug and on the other hand just allowing your imagination to show you uh, another way to show you how you that it is possible to resolve the problem and that very clearly comes across both in your drawing in the form of the drawing and the colors and in the feeling that you had as you did it. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for letting me share.